steps of my king. Thank you for watching or listening to this podcast of Idleman Unplugged. We've also got Pastors Unplugged on this side where I talk to pastors uh, on a monthly basis trying to encourage them. And uh, the guest that we have on today, Senator Josh uh, Hawley, thank you so much from the great state of Missouri and um, constitutional attorney, if I remember correctly, and another best-selling author. And you've got a book out um, actually now on manhood and people can find it Amazon or any other Barnes & Noble. Manhood the masculine virtues America needs. So thank you for joining this episode of Idleman Unplugged. Excited to have you on. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. What's the main, uh, what's your main point of the book? I mean, as far as, and I had some questions, but I just want to hear your heart and yeah. um, really get to the point because we are, the masculinity is at a deficit right now, especially in our nation when we need it the most. Yeah, it sure is. I mean, here's the main takeaway for me in the book. It's really all about what the Bible says to men. And I think if you go all the way back to Genesis, you see that God has an incredible purpose and plan for men. And he says to Adam, when he creates the first man and he puts him in this garden that God has made, yeah. he gives him an incredible purpose, which is to take care of that garden, but also to expand it, to, to push it out. Right. And I think what we learn from that is men is God calls us to bring order from chaos. He calls us to make a garden in the wilderness. He calls us to confront evil and to bring light. And that is a grand, grand purpose for men that we then see carried across the scriptures, ultimately fulfilled in the person of Jesus. And the book is really about that and what we can learn from that as men today about our calling. Amen. We, we need that more than ever before. And I don't know if you know it, but you're in a great encouragement to a lot of us, even pastors, when you in during the Senate hearings and you say what needs to be said and you call people out. It's We have lost that. Um, and we're celebrating, you know, 4th of July is coming up. And we have to remember that our nation was built on the backs of men of integrity and character. They spoke the truth in love. And we've got to get back to that somehow. I don't know. Do you have any, what, what would be the main thing hindering men from returning to that, that masculine portrayal that they see in the Bible? I mean, number one, not reading the Bible. So not knowing what it is, but, uh, beyond that, what, what do you think that where, do, where's the deficit? Well, I think it's really a lack of vision. I think what men have heard now for decades from mm -hmm. the popular culture, which is really a, an increasingly left-influenced, leftist culture, is that yeah. masculinity is toxic, always 100%, that men are trash. And mm -hmm. I quote people, I'm not just making this up. I mean, it's unbelievable, these phrases, men yeah, are right. trash. Yeah. But actual academics, you know, lefties, have said this and have beat this into the head of men. And I think so many young men, especially, who I talk to, they just don't have a vision for their lives. And this is why I think it's so important to open up the scripture and say, listen, God has an incredible vision for your life as a man. Right. He's called you to be a person of destiny. He's called you to change the destiny of your life and your family and this nation. And you do that by taking on responsibility, by living into the obligations that he has given you and the call that he has on your life. So I think for men... The, the vision and purpose is so, so key. Men will do a lot of things if they've got purpose. You know, I mean, look at Absolutely. the greatest generation, right? I mean, they crossed an ocean, turned back tyranny, sacrificed their lives for a purpose. So I think men today need that purpose. Absolutely. And that's why I think the book will help a great deal because you have to have the inspiration and that motivation. But uh, as a pastor, I, I even think a lot of men need to repent of their apathy. You know, repentance is a beautiful word. It's a changing of your mind that changes to your actions and that, uh, I, I don't know, I don't think, I don't know if I shared this with your, um, uh, with your representative, but we posted your, your quick excerpt talking about revival as our only hope. And that I probably close to a million views so far on my Instagram channel, but just that, that desire for revival, a spiritual awakening, I believe is our only hope. I've been saying that for years that, you know, elections are important. They have consequences and, 2024 is going to be very important and getting people in positions of leadership like yourself are very important, but we need another massive spiritual awakening by the sovereign hand of God. And that often comes through brokenness and humility and prayer and fasting and repentance. And so um, I, I, I don't know if you see any of that as well, especially where you're at. I, I agree with that 100%. I mean, I think what this country needs is, is another great awakening. And listen, the history of America mm -hmm. is the history of revivals. I mean, it was really a revival, yeah, yeah, the true. first Great Awakening in the 1730s and 40s that united the nation and helped spur revolution. It was the second Great Awakening that led mm -hmm. to the abolitionist movement and uh, the, the whole changing of American society. 
So, and I would just say that, you know, revival, if you look at that biblically, revival begins with personal repentance and a personal commitment yep. to following the Lord, a personal commitment to put, to surrendering your character and your heart to the Lord and having him form it. And I just think for men, you want to see this nation change. Men, it begins in your heart. It begins with your character. And yes. that is the ultimate message yes. for me of this book. It's the most mm-hmm. the significant message that I can think to offer any other man, which is that your character can determine the destiny of nations, can determine the destiny of this nation. And that we need to call men up. That's an incredible vision. It's also an incredible responsibility. And I think we need to call men up to it. Well, that's a great point because I think that's where the enemy gets us discouraged and distracted is I can't really make a difference, you know, and, but you look at all the people who do make a difference like yourself or pastors, you know, that are making, that are, that are pushing the the truth and love and, and getting, bringing back that standard. They, they were, they were nobodies. They were just growing up. They loved the Lord and God filled them with the fire of the spirit. And then they went out and did great exploits because you plus God is the majority. That's right. The, the, That's the right. man plus God is the majority and we can, we can make a huge difference. Uh, and I think where you're at, you hear a lot of the separation of church and state. Really what they're saying is, Hey, shut your mouth. I don't want to hear the truth. And that's why they're trying to silence the pulpits. They're trying to silence because masculine, biblical masculinity doesn't put up with a lot of stuff. They, they love, but they're also filled with holy fire, seeing what the transgender movement is doing and with little kids there and the drag shows and biblical masculinity will, will it not violent, of course, but uh, prayer and fasting and saying, not on our watch, we're going to take a stand. I think that's why it's so detrimental and dangerous to the woke culture is that that's the only thing that's really going to stop them. It, it, and that's, well, you know, if you, if you demasculine, I don't know if that's a word, uh, if, if you take away the masculinity, it's toxic, uh, dress up as a woman, don't, don't be uh, bold. Then that's when the enemy can come in and push their agenda very easily. Very absolutely. Easily. And that's why the left in this country for years now have said to men, here's what you should do with your life. You should go down to the basement, turn on your computer, look at your screen, you know, buy some stuff, be a consumer, be, be a, an androgynous right. consumer who's passive. That's what they want from men is just be a, a passive consumer. And this is the the vision that men have to reject. We have to say, no, no, no. God has called us to so much more than that. We are called to stand up for our families. We are called to be providers, to be protectors, to live in a self-sacrificial way that empowers mm-hmm. others, ultimately after the pattern of Jesus. I mean, that's what every man is called to, whether he recognizes Jesus as Lord or not. He's called to live into that pattern. And no way, that is... That's the pattern of destiny. That's the pattern of significance. That's the pattern that is is yes. meaningful and leaves a legacy. And I think that's why we've got to call men to it. Hmm. And when you mentioned the first great awakening with you know George Whitfield and Jonathan Edwards and Wesley's, and of course, what a lot of people don't realize is they actually changed the political climate of the nation. They would preach politically hot. They would preach on political hot buttons. They would talk about the legislation, the laws, and the leaders. And now we want to get away from that because we want the church to, you know, kind of uh, just be quiet and, and do your own thing. But I don't know if you're seeing any of that change in Washington. Uh, is there are people getting so, you know, just conf- not confused, but yeah, I guess confused and angry with what's going on that there could be a shift and even you know, listening to what the churches have to say, or is that still a big a big issue where you're at? Well, certainly, I think what what the left would say is the church needs to be quiet. You know, you can have freedom of worship within the bounds of your church, but otherwise, mm-hmm. separation of church and state. And they hate it when when even people like me, you know, I'm not a pastor, but when I oh, yeah. talk about the Bible in public, when I talk about my Christian faith, they just melt down. I mean, they just can't stand it. It's like, wow. oh, don't talk about that stuff. But I think if you want to know what's going to change this nation, the church getting bold, the church saying we are going to mm-hmm. speak into the needs of today. We're going to proclaim the gospel for every sphere of life. We're not going to be told that the gospel doesn't apply to politics. The gospel doesn't apply to economics. That No, it does. Because in over every realm of life, the gospel is relevant. Over every realm of life, Jesus is Lord. So I think that is going to be the real turning point. And I think we're starting to see that. COVID, I think, really woke up a lot of churches oh, because okay. they've never been shut down like that before. And I think now a lot of people are saying, hold on, we're going to be more bold. Yeah, that was a little too easy. You know, it was like, uh, wow, they can really shut down everything. I mean, it was just yeah. amazing how, how easy that can be done. And then I think a lot of us at first were kind of wondering, what is this COVID? You know, and then once, 
once the shenanigans come out and, uh, you know, you have a real virus that, you know, I, I have friends that, that passed away because of it, but also what the government, they weaponized it without a shadow yes. of a doubt. And so once the churches recognize that, they begin to take a stand. But I'm curious, how did you come up? How did you find that boldness, uh, especially to run for a senator in Missouri, to, to speak out on these things? Was there a turning point in your life where you had to make that decision? Well, I first I ran for office a few years ago for the first time because I had been a lawyer of working on religious liberty cases. It was a constitutional lawyer mm -hmm. and going case by case, trying to defend the rights of the church, trying to defend the rights of believers, trying to defend the right of conscience. And I, I love that work. I thought it was so important, but I just reached a point where I thought, you know, it, it, it's great to do this case by case, but but we're fighting a huge tide, an onslaught. We've got to do this on a bigger scale. And there's an incredible power when states, I ran first for state attorney general, when the states will actually stand up and say, we're going to defend mm. the religious liberties of our people. We're going to defend the yes. rights of our people. And that, that's what got me to run for attorney general. And then I ran for the Senate for really the same reason. I just thought we we're at a critical turning point, a historical moment as mm -hmm. a country right now when our foundational convictions, you know, are we going to be a country that honors mm -hmm. the Lord? Are we going to be a country that honors conscience and honors worship mm -hmm. and honors freedom of speech? These are all things rooted in the Bible. Are we going to continue to do that? Or are we going to have our whole character as a nation changed? That to me is really what we're fighting for. And it's why I ran for the Senate. Oh man. Can you imagine if we had more people who believed that way? And that's why politics matters, you know, it, and biblically speaking, politics just means governing or leading a group of people. So it's very, very biblical. God's word has a lot to say about uh, those different things. I just want to get a few questions here sure. um, that really came from your book. The inspiration to be a loving, uh, present, loving, present, supportive father in an age where fatherlessness is, is at an all time high. So here's what I've, when I talk to men, I used to speak at a lot of men's conferences before I pastored. And uh, I would remind men that you don't have to leave home to be an absentee father. Mm. You can, you can check out mentally, emotionally, and God help us spiritually. And that was just a good, that point really stood out from your book that, you know, absentee fathers are those who are even at home, but they're so busy you know, keeping up with the Joneses and, and doing other things are really the, 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 the nation. If we, you know, and I don't want to get too deep here, but the, if men would look in the mirror, we have to take responsibility for what's happening with our nation. As the family goes, so goes the nation. So you saw the breakdown of the family, the breakdown of society, and now we are reaping that whirlwind. So I just thought that was a profound statement. I didn't know if you could elaborate on that anymore about that, the fatherlessness. I would just say this. And when it comes to fathers, if you want to, curb or end the epidemic of childhood poverty in our nation, put fathers back in the home. Oh. If you want to end the cycle True. of youth violence in our nation, put fathers back in our home. I just say the dads out there, if you think your life doesn't matter, you're dead wrong. You've got the most influential position mm. in America. To be a father is to be called to a destiny and a legacy. And I would just say that, listen, you don't have to do it perfectly. I don't. And I, I write about this in the book. You know, oh, I, I yeah. think sometimes as dads, yeah. We, we get hesitant because we think, ah, I, you know, I, I, last time I tried that, it didn't work. I, I feel like I messed it up. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter. What I found is if you will invest the time, if you will make the effort, the Lord will bless it. It's just that simple. His grace is so powerful. If you will invest in your children and see their formation, you know, the formation of their hearts, the formation of their character, see that as your responsibility, Man, that is the gateway to your legacy. I mean, that is the gateway to significance. And it truly, that will change the world. Oh, that is so true because sometimes we think we have to be perfect and do everything just right. And, you know, uh, you're busier than I am, I'm sure. But the hard part for me is I have, you know, five kids all under 18 or 18 and under. And so finding that time for each one or that devotional time and um, just trying to connect with them again. But there's a difference between perfection and direction. You know, it's not about perfection, but at least the heart of the father should be, I'm prioritizing my family and my walk with the Lord. And you watch what God will do with humility. It's absolutely amazing. Uh, let me see. One of the other ones that stood out, um, life lessons from your father figures, father figures, I guess, who raised you to become the man you are today. I wanted to just tap into that a little bit. Who influenced you to what degree? Well, 
I, I've been I've been so blessed with men in my life who have really poured into me. My grandfather, I write about him a lot. He was a farmer. He's no mm. he's he's not with us now any longer. He's home with the Lord, but he was a farmer his whole life long. I always say that he was not a wealthy man. He was not a well connected man. He wasn't in the right. eyes of the world. He didn't have a lot of social significance, but he was a man of significance and a man of purpose. He raised six kids. He, he worked his entire life. You know, when he into his 80s, he was still farming until he had a stroke and physically wow. could not get out of bed. And the, his model to me of what it looks like to provide, to protect, to invest in others, he was a model for me, still is, of what it means to be a godly man. Mm -hmm. I had coaches who poured into my life and modeled mm -hmm. it for me. Uh, my own father, of course. And I just think as a father now, and for all the men out there, maybe who are a little bit older, this is where you can have such influence with younger men. Yes. Younger men today are desperate for father figures. We have so many absentee fathers. They're desperate for father figures. I've had many spiritual fathers in my life. You can be a spiritual father, even if you're not a biological father. And, and we need men to yeah, tap into absolutely. that kind of significance and that kind of ministry, frankly. And your, what about your father, too? Was he instrumental or not as, as much as your grandfather? No, he, he absolutely was. And I, I write about uh, him in the book. You know, with my dad, well, okay. one of the things that I thought he showed me and that I really took away from him is my dad was never one for being boastful. He was never one for saying, well, a real man is, is a guy who, can, who, who has the most money or who can drive the fastest car. Yeah. My dad had this great confidence in himself as a man. And what he modeled for me was is that if you love the Lord and if you're a man of character, that's what a man mm -hmm. is. And he helped me understand, you know, before I could wow. really even get it, you know, it took me years later to kind of get it intellectually, but he helped me understand yeah. just at a gut level that manhood is a journey of character. You know, it's about a real man is a man of character. He is a man of yes. service. He's a man of sacrifice. And you can be confident in who you are, who God's called you to be. If you've got that confidence of character, it's not about the job title. It's not about the income. It's not True. about anything mm -hmm. else. And he, to, for me, my dad was really an anchor for that. Well, you know, a lot of people don't realize is, you know, fathers are heroes to their kids because they see not only are they older, but they've got through life, you know, hopefully a successful marriage. And, and if they blow it, they repent and they ask for forgiveness. And so they see what they're, as they're getting older, what they fear, they fear the future. They don't know what to expect, especially with what's going on in the world. And then they see somebody who's actually getting through it and holding on to their sanity and holding on to, to Christ. And, and, and that they want to emulate that because they have a, a success, a, a, a person of success that they can follow after. Now, of course, that's not the case with many who will be listening to this as well. Their homes are anything but, um, perfect or anything but, a Christian community that, you know, alcoholism to uh, abuse to just absentee fathers. But even in their case, if we can point them back to Christ and that relationship with God, he can become more than they ever dreamed of. I think that's why it's so important with your book. It's pointing people ultimately to that relationship with God. Absolutely. And I would just say to the young men out there whose father was absent or had a, you have a terrible relationship with your dad or he was an extremely negative influence in your life. That doesn't have to be your destiny. You know, that does not have to control no, you. Absolutely. You can be the one who breaks that in your family. You can create a new destiny with your family through the Lord. He will father you mm -hmm. spiritually. He will bring new spiritual fathers into your life. Yep. And that's the power and the promise of following him and living into the pattern he means for you is that you can break generational cycles. You can change the whole future of your Amen. family. I mean, it's it's a powerful, powerful thing. And I think young men need to hear that because so many, to your point, they grow up without fathers or their fathers are, are are bad influences in their life. That does not have to control you. You can you can change no. the whole trajectory of your family. And and actually the the not that, that there's any good from that, but a good point from that type of brokenness would, would be you see a lot of those men who completely surrender to God are just completely on fire for God. It's almost like that brokenness drew, drew them to the cross. That brokenness and that dependence, it, it led them to a deep relationship with God. So, you know, all things work together if, if we commit to God and and, re, and and give him our weaknesses and, our, and as well as our strengths, of course, because we want to stay humble. But I am a little curious, what, what is one of your struggles as a father? Maybe if the guys can relate. Being gone a lot, is that too much on your end? Are you home a lot or... 
Because you've got I, three I, kids? I've got three kids. I've got a, a two boys, 10 years right. old and eight years old. And then I've got a two-year-old baby girl. Ooh. And so, yeah, absolutely. I mean, making time, constantly wow. making time for them, prioritizing them. I also think it's important to prioritize my wife, their mom, and to, to create a, and this is something mm -hmm. that I've got to constantly remind myself, it, it's, it's vital to pour into the kids, but just as important is they need to see me prioritizing their mother. They need True. to see me saying that relationship with mom is the key relationship, honoring her, loving her, uh, sacrificing my interests for her. And so I think, you know, a constant challenge, I bet for every man, but certainly mm -hmm. for me is constantly saying, okay, I need to put her first. I need to, I need to lift her up and I need my kids to see me doing that. Cause you talk about setting a model, setting a pattern. They oh, need to man. see me saying, man. mom has got to be cherished, honored and, and respected and valued here. And I just hope if I, if I can do that, however imperfectly, and I write about the sum of the book, it is imperfect, mm -hmm. but I, I just think the effort is, is huge here. And if the kids can see that they, I hope will then be able to form those relationships to respect mm -hmm. women in the case of my boys and uh, to be able to have that, that grounding and knowing what that looks like to form a family and to love one woman for your whole life. Yeah, I mean, I just, I hope I can remember it, but I read a poem on Father's Day this last Sunday um, up to the dads. It went something like, the lectures you give me may be very wise and true, but I'd rather get my lesson by observing what you do. Mm -hmm. For I may misunderstand you and the high advice you give, but dad, there's no misunderstanding how you act and how you live. And so, so our character is definitely, not only it can be taught, of course, but it has to be caught. It has to be you know, implement. And I, I just think it's a great, your, your book is a great encouragement to men to get, get back up and fight again. And that's, what would you tell the person maybe coming out of rehab or who, who, who hasn't been doing a great job and who maybe their kids are, uh, he's missed some time with them and he's, he's kind of, um, hopeless, I guess would be, would be where he's at. And I deal with that a lot in my area of Los Angeles County, for sure. A lot of hopelessness in men. I would just say that to the men out there, no matter how many mistakes you made, no matter how many regrets you have, that if you will invest your life, if you will take up the responsibility that's right in front of you, God will bless that and multiply it and use it in powerful ways. That your past does not have to Amen. control your future. It doesn't. It, it does not have to control your future. Your life can change. And it can change by taking on the responsibility that God has given you and living into his purpose for you. Ultimately, it changes, as, as you and I know, by giving your life to Jesus Christ. I mean, let's just get to that. That is, you, you want to yes. know true destiny? You want to find your true purpose in life? Give your life to Jesus. Mm -hmm. Come to Jesus. Give him everything you've got. That's the way forward. That's the only way forward for any of us at the end. But I, I just think that Amen. so often, I know as a father myself, again, that sometimes you, you make a mistake, and we all make mistakes, you can feel like, ah, oh, you know, whether it's a, a little mistake or a big one, you can think, man, I just, I'm not any good at this. You know what? We don't have to be perfect. We don't. And no matter how much you feel like you've messed it up, if you will take that next step of obedience and faith, you will see God honor that and begin to work change in you and through you. And I just think that's incredibly helpful. Oh man, that's, I hope that's what men take away. And then, um, and they remember that it's not, you know, the past, of course, there's consequences, but I'd rather live in God's arms of forgiveness, redeemed and back in his will than to live outside of his will and dealing with those circumstances as well. Right. So, Senator Holly, I appreciate your time. I don't want to I don't want to keep you. I don't know if you have any last words, but I'm going to encourage people to um, even pastors. We got a lot of pastors who will listen to this to order a box of your book and give it to their men's group. I mean, that's what we're going to do. I don't know. Is there, it, would it be good to go to the publisher or just go on uh, christianbook.com or Amazon and, and go that route? Yeah, those are great. Christianbook.com, Amazon, Books okay. a Million. You can get it at any of those places. And uh, thank you for having okay. me. And I just say to the, to the men out there that uh, men, this country needs you, your family needs you, and the Lord has a tremendous purpose for your life. He wants to do things through you that he wouldn't do through anybody else. That's what it means to be called and chosen by the Lord. It's an incredibly high destiny and it's out there for you. So lean into it. Amen. Amen. One last mention, Manhood, the Masculine Virtues, American Needs by Senator Josh Hawley. And I would encourage everyone to pick up a, uh, a box uh, for your men's ministry and hand them out in the foyer. And we've got to get this message out there of character and how important that is. So Senator, thank you so much. I will see Thanks you maybe next time on another future podcast. Thank you. All right, thank you.